What my greatest hope is for our culture is that we have equitable, equitable appreciation beyond entertainment. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping that we have equitable appreciation beyond entertainment. Our culture is just as rich as any other culture. And being able to appreciate us beyond the athletes, beyond the musicians, um, and into the more um, serious realms, I think is what this represents mm -hmm. as Kamala Harris being our vice president because that is something that is more serious. It is more powerful. She has a seat of influence. And my hope is that people will take that dive into, well, what is an HBCU? What is a Divine Nine sorority? What is a sorority? When you say soror, what do you mean? What are the differences between, yeah. between all of them? Because they're very commonplace for, for us to be able to say, oh, she's an AKA. And we, we don't have to say the whole thing or right. oh, she's a Delta or when you say that you're in an organization that people instantly guess which one you are, you know, that kind of just having that kind <laughs> of um, that kind of fluid conversation about our culture um, in in both serious and non serious environments without all of this tensity around it, um, I think is what will normalize it because you know we're not like these uh we're not we're still people so right. uh you know we're not these like you know, many icons where you know we have to you know tiptoe around the subjects and different things like that like no we're, we're regular people this is our everyday life this is our culture and you know it's I like it. I mean, I, yeah. I guess I grew up in it, so I'm biased. <laughs> but, um, you know, I like it, and I want people to appreciate it beyond entertainment. Like, you know, appreciate our music and our mm. athletes, but also appreciate our food, appreciate our hair texture, appreciate our education, appreciate our lingo. Like, appreciate the different things that make a culture a culture, um, and appreciate our leaders beyond the civil rights leaders and the entertainers. Like, we also have phenomenal educators. We have phenomenal musicians we have phenomenal uh, news reporters we have uh, a phenomenal uh, teacher like there's just so many field. things yeah we're in every field and and we're doing phenomenal things in them um, but I, I just hope that people begin to appreciate our culture um, for more than entertainment absolutely and appreciate not appropriate yes Yes, that is. We're just gonna set that right there. Yes, appreciate leave that right where it appreciate. is. Appreciate, <laughs> not appropriate. Leave that right where not it appropriate. Is. But um, just being able to have those explanations coupled with experiences, which is why we have to share rooms with people so that they can understand more, they can experience more. Um, and again, hopefully that would move to us um, being less of an anomaly and more of you know this is just like a, a regular thing for me, like. Um, and, and I do think that we, we have to be more intentional about that. Um, we being the entire world <laughs> have to be more intentional about sharing spaces with each other and then creating um, a space that's really comfortable enough for people to ask questions because that's a, a, a part of the conversation that doesn't get enough mm. um, attention. Again, like when I was doing those conversations, um, it was very diverse. Um, and, and one of the things that, you know, especially older white people would say to me is that thank you for making me feel comfortable mm. asking you questions because they would previously be scared, you know, that they were going to be offensive. And while well-intentioned, you know, ignorance right. can sometimes come off as um offensive yeah so making sure that the space is set to where you can ask me something I won't get offended I understand that you have this ignorance because of you know how you grew up where you grew up you know not being intentional about venturing into other circles that is what it was we're here now you want to know something now and whether it's as simple as how did your hair go from short to long or something <laughs> as complicated as what is the difference in between equality and equity? Mm. Like, 
I'm, I'm open to having the conversation because the conversations need to be had and the only way that we're really going to be able to see um, some change is not just by you know forcing ourselves into rooms or being invited into rooms but it's really more so everybody who if everyone who is in the room black white or other you know wanting to see the same thing and that is progress tell me about your love for HBCUs. So I'll preface it with prior to going to an HBCU, I did not recognize the drastic difference between uh, a predominantly white university and an HBCU. I applied to both because I was just trying to go to schools where I could get a scholarship. I um, landed at Elizabeth City State University in Elizabeth City, North Carolina because I was there on a choir scholarship. Um, I went to the campus and I, I loved what I saw, even though I'm a native of Virginia. It was like in North Carolina, but close enough to Virginia to where I could get home if I still need to and right. see all my friends. Mm -hmm. um, but. Once I got there, I really realized how impactful being at an HBCU was for me. You know, I went to all Title I schools growing up, and, uh, you know, we, I was just a part of the underserved community. Didn't mean anything um, about it. It was very normal to me. But going to HBCU was the first time that I saw a lot of black men with PhDs. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were running the schools, they were directing the choirs, they were, you know, chair of this department, chair of that, and I had not previously seen that. Um, it was also my first time seeing a lot of black women with PhDs, and, and it became, simply by looking at it, more attainable to me. And then we got into the history of this school and that this school was a teacher's college. And, and this is where black people came to school to learn how to become teachers, to be able to teach other black students who otherwise would not have been taught. And then the significance of that just, it really is like attracted to where it just pulls you in to want to really dive deeply into the culture. And, and once I got there, you know, a lot of my professors like pulled, I'm shy. Nobody believes it, but I am shy. Okay, by, now, Alana. Okay. I am, I'm shy by, by nature. And um, my professors pulled me and threw me into like, no, you know, you're, you're gonna be student conductor. I'm like, me? Like, just cause I can play the piano? Yes, you're gonna be student conductor. You're gonna be section leader. And they threw me into those leadership positions. I was um, afforded my sorority um, advisor at the time, she said, you need to run for Miss ECSU. I said, uh, uh, I'm not, you know, I, I don't think I could do, no, you're going to do it. And, uh, you know, just even being, I, I, that's where I pledged um, Delta Sigma Theta in my sorority and, and just that, you know, opening up my, my personality to a lot of people and really increasing my network um, to where it became more of a family where you kind of saw... I would say black people in general as less of a homogenous group of people. Mm -hmm. You got to see the diversity where you had people who, you know, grew up with a silver spoon in their mouth and people who grew up with nothing, you know, kind of, it really leveled the playing field of, of that and it opened up your mind to, to the greatness, I guess, of, of our culture and it didn't kind of minimize it to the smaller things that we hear in history. So, so that was one thing of why I, I loved Elizabeth City State. Mm -hmm. I will always love ECSU. I'm currently the youngest serving, um, and I was the youngest ever serving um, foundation board member to the board of directors there. And I, I told them, you know, I, while I completely appreciated the invitation, being able to be on a board of a university where I used to go to ask them for scholarships <laughs> and now I'm there to help administer scholarships to other people. Like that is something that I guess speaks to the opportunity mm -hmm. of an HBCU. I was on that board before I was 30 and that's not something that's widely no. done, but only an HBCU would give a chance like that. Um, and thankfully I, I've been able to get there to raise money, to involve younger alumni in giving money and really use that opportunity um, that, and I, I didn't waste it and, and serve with uh, chairs who were, you know, serve with people yeah. who were, you know, chairs when I was there as a student. Yeah. And they remember me, you know, in the choir and they remember me as the campus queen. Um, 
Come on, campus yes. queen. <laughs> oh, okay, I saw you sliding. Day. Come on, campus queen. So, uh, and they remember me in that capacity. So they too get to, you know, relish in the growth of me mm -hmm. as an individual. Um, but then I also went to Norfolk State University for my master's in, in Virginia. And again, I, I chose to go to another HBCU because I really just appreciated how they could take, you know, a shy girl like me and, you know, push me into the direction that, you know, they always saw was attainable for me, but that I may not have seen as attainable for myself. Why do you think HBCUs don't get the love that they deserve? We're underfunded. Um, think about it. When you turn on the TV and you're looking at ESPN, how often do you see HBCUs football teams up there? Never. Okay, now I'm going to use this as an example because I'm in South Carolina and because my husband was a, formerly the youngest trustee at South Carolina State University. South Carolina State University has produced more NFL players than any of the other institutions in this state. However, how often do you see them on TV being broadcasted as a university? Yeah. Exactly. So I just say that to say that we don't necessarily get the recognition um, that we deserve in other communities, but it is certainly there in our own communities, which is good, but we definitely, mm -hmm. um, we produce some of the greatest leaders in, in America. And, and I do believe that um, the more that we talk about our beloved institutions, because if you talk to anybody who went to HBC, one thing that they will say is how much they love yeah. being in college. Mm -hmm. um, they love the environment. And it was a chance for, for four years, you can just, or more <laughs> for some people, <laughs> you can go and you can be yourself. You don't have to explain your hair to anybody. You don't have to explain your food choices to anybody. You don't have to explain your upbringing to anybody. It's really a situation where if you know, you know. Yeah. And, and it's appreciated and it's not muffled. And it's, it's really, you know, almost an encouraging situation to where you have ongoing, um, ongoing encouragement to be you. Yeah. And then you can take that, because the argument is, you know, the HBCUs don't prepare you for the real world. And that's just simply not true. I'm in the real world, and I went to two HBCUs in all Title I schools, and I think I'm doing <laughs> just fine. You're living your best life. You know, right. And, and I do believe that because, um, you know, I, I feel confident being me in any space that I'm in because I was able to be me without having to muffle it or, you know, turn it around to fit any fit in anywhere else. I wasn't forced to fit in, and, and nobody who goes to an HBCU is forced to fit in. You get to be yourself no matter what that version of you is, mm -hmm. and it's all love. And, and that is why I, I love HBCU. That is why I advocate for HBCUs, um, and I, that is why I will continue to give and serve to, to the HBCU culture. You just feel so safe because you feel comfortable being yourself, and you, there's a, a real sense of, of community there mm. that you might not otherwise get. Um, so, and, and even um, just using music as an example, and it might get a little technical because I do have two degrees in music, but <laughs> hey, but um, in certain spaces, um, you know, tone almost where you can tell what somebody is or what their ethnicity is by listening to them. Um, it's the same when you're singing. And so traditionally, there's a certain sound that choirs look for. Um, and if they call it a tone, a tone quality is what they call it. And for years when we were auditioning for, you know, growing up when you're auditioning for all city chorus or all district chorus or all state chorus, it was the tone quality that kept a lot of minorities out of being in those all state choirs. Well, when I got to an HBCU, everybody in the choir had the same tone quality and it was good. And when people come to, to, to an HBCU choral festival or concert or anything of the sort, you get our natural tone quality and nobody has to take the color out of our voice for us to, to value it. And, you know, when I was teaching music and I, I, I was the judge or got to be one of the judges for all district or all city or all state, that was one of the things that I was very cognizant of. I'm not going to 
uh, devalue someone's tone because I can tell what ethnicity they are mm. when they're singing. You know, I, I, and I don't, um, because I got to sing in a choir where our tone was appreciated in its most natural state. Yeah. Um, so, and that's just one example, you know, that I could use, but I'm sure that there are several others where, you know, people um, intentionally take color out of the situation where it is a part, it is integral in your identity. Absolutely. And so being able to be confident in that uh, was just something that I, absolutely needed mm -hmm. in my adolescence to be who I could really be in my adulthood. 